allow everyone to tune in first and then we'll welcome everybody in another minute. Just another 30 seconds or so, team. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome everybody to another webinar by the CSF Task Force. And it's a pleasure to welcome such a fantastic team and something that I as one individual was very keen to for this to happen on this subject of spontaneous intracranial hypotension and really the team need no introduction but I think they are the, uh, there's clear evidence and agreement that they are for sure the, the leading team on this disorder um, in, in Europe and perhaps even the world so I'm very uh, grateful to, to them uh, for, for coming and joining this webinar today and helping to educate uh, and for us to learn together. Um, so, Professor Jürgen Beck, uh, Horst Burbach, and Christian Fong, welcome. Um, Jürgen uh, is a dear colleague who's um, trained in, in Munich and then subsequently in Boston and has uh, done his neurosurgical training and, and begun his career, extensive career in Germany and also worked in Switzerland. And it's close to my heart that he's a trained vascular and skull based specialist and uh, interest in tumors um, uh, and uh, has taken a special interest in CSF disorders and especially this condition. Um, it, it was, um, it, it's pretty, uh, he's well published in this area. And um, I think it'd be true to say that he, they take part in something like close to 200 surgeries for this condition alone. And they get referrals regarding this condition from all over Europe and particularly from Germany. Uh, and the team that he's put together, Christian Fong, uh, as well as uh, Horst, uh, who is the, perhaps the leading radiologist in this disorder in Europe, and if not the world, um, I'm very, very grateful to them. Um, Christian will kindly start the discussion and the presentation on pathology and pathophysiology, as well as the diagnostics related to uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension and then hand over to Horst, who will discuss the radiological features in greater detail. And then uh, finally, last but not least, Jürgen will discuss surgical treatment and key surgical strategies and points in this disorder. Uh, and I invite everybody to um, take part, to put their questions in the Q&A section. As all of us know, this condition is becoming increasingly common and well recognized. And I remember the day when I was a very young junior and it was just becoming described in terms of imaging. Uh, and of course, because of its prevalence somewhere around or its incidence somewhere around, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 in a particular unit uh, any one year, none of us get large volumes. But here we're going to discuss the basics of the condition and how to manage as conservative as possible all the way to the top levels of treatment and the most complex cases. So I'm very grateful to the team. And once again, welcome. So Christian, if you, um, maybe I can hand over to Jürgen to introduce, uh, say a few words, if you don't mind, uh, Professor Beck. Thank you. So Matsuo, thank you very much for this very, very kind introduction. And thank you to the EANS to, to give us the opportunity to talk about spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And next slide, Matsuo, you asked us to give a short introduction, a short story, how this all started. And we, I also started as uh, I was trained, as you said, as a neurovascular tumor surgeon and had one or two cases a year. And this man, Walter Schiewing, I was told by Andreas Rabe, my chairman and friend at that time, to, to give um, a short journal club. And I read the publications of Walter and I really get fascinated and interested by this disease. And we had the first case in Frankfurt and the first case in, in Bern. And we put together a team at the time in Bern and really were into finding the leak. And then the first highlight was in 2016, we managed to, to do together the first specific conference only on SIH in the beautiful Lake Thun near Bern in Switzerland. And there's Mark Chosnika who put together the pathophysiology, Andrea Sarabi, who always supported me, letting me doing the surgeries, letting me invest all the time and costly investigations 
and to do the surgeries with Christian Fung and Christian Ulrich. And next slide, not to forget Jan Grala, who is the chair of neuroimmunology in Bern, who really was the one we went together to the angio suite and relentlessly searched the league and doing angios and myelograms again and myelograms again and myelograms again. So this is how it all started. And we were friends and Walter, I called Walter to, to come to this conference. He came with his family and you know, we continue to work together with LA, with the CEDA signing, with the people in Duke, in the Mayo Clinic in Toronto, and of course in Bern. So next slide, please. So it started in Frankfurt, spent 10 years work in Bern, and now since three years, I happen to become chair in Freiburg, where, as you mentioned, Horst Urbach is the chair of neurobiology. So we can, can join in this endeavor and, and uh, our hobbies, so to say, and have a lot of expertise there now. So next slide. This is Freiburg, a little but beautiful town in the Tassan part of Germany. This is the view of the Black Forest. Here is beautiful Hotzenwald. And if you have clear view, you can even see the Alps. And here is this burn, and here's Lake Thun where the conference um, took place. So next slide. This is our university hospital. This is the neurocenter where we are lucky to have neurology, neuroideology, and neurosurgery in one place. We have six theaters running each day. And as I will show you and Horst later, even did two fistulas endovascularly today. So please, Christian, um, thanks, Mansoor, again for the introduction. And please, Christian, you can go ahead with the presentation and pathophysiology of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Yes, uh, thank you. And Mansoor, again, uh, very, I'm very happy to be part of this ENS webinar series here. And I'd like to start off the, with the presentation and pathophysiology of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And uh, well, what defines spontaneous intracranial hypotension and what causes it? Uh, as you can see, see here on this slide, actually a spinal CSF leak is the cause for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. This uh, ex uh, excessive CSF loss actually causes consecutive sagging of uh, nervous structures within the bony cavity. And uh, this sagging, this uh, downward displacement of these nervous structures within the bony cavity actually is responsible for all the symptoms these patients display. So what you can say is actually that a spontaneous intracranial hypotension is a spinal disease. When talking about SAH, we have to talk about um, diagnostic protocols. And according to the International Classification of Headache Disorders, SAH is, of course, um, meets the, the autostatic headache at the S diagnostic criterion. But this diagnostic headache has to occur in relation to a low CSF opening pressure or evidence of CSF leaking on imaging. And as you have seen already, uh, I've put autostatic headache in brackets because autostatic headache is uh, only present in patients during the acute phase. Very often we see patients that have long lasting symptoms for many um, weeks or even many months. And those patients where you have chronic symptoms, they don't display this typical autostatic headache anymore. So. Yes, autostatic headache is part of the disease, uh, is part of the classification system, but keep in mind, many patients with long lasting symptoms don't have this autostatic part of the headache. Um, how often do we diagnose spontaneous intracranial hypertension? I think before the introduction of the MRI into daily clinical practice, uh, SAH was a rarity. It was rarely diagnosed. Um, doctors didn't know about the disease, but now with increasing MRIs being done with the um, bright awareness of the disease. I think nowadays uh, SAH can be interpreted as an important cause for daily and new onset headaches. And actually it has an incidence comparable to aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I think uh, new surgeons must be aware of this disease and must be aware that it's there and how to diagnose and treat the disease. When talking about SAH, you clearly have to differentiate SAH from uh, other um, diseases that also are related to intracranial hypotension, but those are not the spontaneous part. Uh, you clearly have to differentiate spontaneous intracranial hypotension from post dual puncture syndrome from patients that suffer from post-surgical leak and CSF loss. Of course, you have to differentiate it from overshunting and also from patients that uh, present uh, frontobasal CSF leaks. So these diseases might uh, also are in line with intracranial hypertension, but it's not the spontaneous intracranial hypertension we are talking about. 
<clears throat> females are more often affected than men. Uh, I think this uh, slide from Dr. Sheaving shows this clearly. And these patients are in the middle of their lives, early 30s up to early 50s, and they're in the middle of their working life. And this disease really tears them out of everything, out of their families, out of their working life. And it's really a dis disabling disease. So we have to really speed up with the diagnosis and treatment in those patients. When those patients present to our offices, what do we see? Like I said before, autostatic headache, of course, this is one uh, key feature of the disease being also part of the diagnostic criterion, but these patients uh, can present a variety of symptoms like uh, general symptoms, nausea and vomiting, but also symptoms that are related to the downward displacement of the nervous structures within the bony cavity uh, and the tearing on the um, cranial nerves, like tinnitus and visual disturbances, also facial pain, but also hormonal changes um, when you um, have a kinking of the um, pituitary stalk. Also cognitive deficits, deficits occur in these patients up to uh, decreased levels of consciousness, up to coma or cerebral hemorrhages. So the variety of symptoms these patients display is very big and you have to be aware of this uh, fact. Of course, when talking about SAH and about the symptoms these patients may display, you also have to talk about chronic subtural hematoma. This um, downward displacement of the brain within the skull causes or can cause chronic subtural hematoma. And we have investigated this in an earlier um, publication in 2014, where we uh, systematically screened patients presenting with a chronic subtural hematoma to our department, patients being younger than 60 years of age. So not the old patients, but patients being younger than 60 years of age. And when screening those patients systematically for a spinal CSF leak, we found that more or less every fourth patient has a spinal CSF leak, which is probably the primary cause for chronic subtural hematoma in these patients, not uh, an unknown trauma, uh, rather a, a proven spinal CSF leak. So be aware of this, patients being at younger age, um, younger than 60 years of age, think of a spinal CSF leak being the cause for the chronic subdural hematoma. Then I can uh, already transfer to the diagnostic workup, uh, our protocol here in Freiburg. It is an interdisciplinary challenge. Without the colleagues from the new radiology department, we would not be able to diagnose the disease and we would not be able to treat the disease. So it's really a hand in hand work. We um, do a diagnostic uh, stepwise protocol in all patients that present to our department. And this stepwise protocol uh, consists actually of uh, imaging, non-invasive imaging with MRI. We do ultrasound investigations, lumbar infusion tests, and then also invasive uh, radiological workups. And it's a stepwise protocol because the more or the higher the suspicion for a spinal CSF leak, the more invasive the um, diagnostics workup will be and um, the further it goes to pinpointing the exact site of the leak of the spinal CSF egress. I'd like to start off with a short uh, overview about the um, optical nerve sheet measurements. And at first we started measuring the optic nerve sheets in these patients and we didn't see any differences at all, um, which was very disappointing at the beginning. So we thought, when uh, are these patients actually symptomatic? These patients are symptomatic when standing up. So we said, okay, we measure the optic nerve sheet diameter in two positions, when the patients are in supine position, lying down, and then when they are in upright position. And so uh, we came to this uh, change in diameter from supine to the upright position. And here on the next slide, you can uh, really see it very nicely when these patients get up by caused by the CSF loss, by the spinal CSF loss, the um, optic nerve sheet really shrinks and becomes smaller. And you can measure this with the um, ultrasound very well. So with the ultrasound of the optic nerve sheet, um, we have a good a diagnostic tool for the primary diagnosis of SAH as well as for the follow-up uh, in treated patients. A second tool that we applied to those patients are lumbar infusion tests. And as you might know, of course, uh, lumbar infusion tests have been introduced in the 1970s by Katzmann and Hussey, um, primarily for the diagnostic work of, of uh, hydrocephalic states. So we took this diagnostic tool and applied it to patients that are at the other end of the CSF disorder, being patients with spontaneous intracranial hypotension. 
And what we do in uh, Freiburg now is we do lumbar, um, uh, do lumbar puncture and we hook up to this lumbar puncture an infusion pump and also a pressure transducer. And we infuse um, at a concent rate of two cc's per minute uh, ring lactate into the spinal canal. And then we record the pressure uh, while infusing uh, this ring lactate in total 50 cc. So, and here on the right hand side, you have two graphs at the top one displaying a healthy patient, and the bottom one being of a patient that has or suffers spontaneous intracranial hypertension. And as you can see very well, the scale is the same that the opening pressure is much higher in the healthy patient compared to the SAH patient. And in the healthy patient, when starting the infusion, you have a steep incline reaching a plateau very well. And then after stop of the infusion, the pressure drops again. Looking at the graph of the SAH patient, you have this steep incline is needle resistance when starting uh, the infusion. But then after that, uh, you really have no incline in pressure like in the normal patient, it goes very slowly and does not reach a plateau at all. So these are the key differences between patients um, that are healthy and those having a spinal CSF leak. So concerning um, the uh, lumbar infusion test, we can say that lumbar infusion test defines a specific uh, pattern of CSF dynamics, um, which describes patients with spontaneous intracranial hypertension. One big advantage of this lumbar infusion test is that the examination is investigator independent. Once you do the lumbar puncture uh, and you have this concentrated infusion, there's nothing that you can do uh, or mess up actually. So uh, it's investigator independent. And to um, our part, you have a bunch of parameters that you can get by uh, uh, the analysis of this lumbar infusion test, which we do with the ICM plus system from Cambridge. Uh, but to our part, the most promising um, diagnostic parameter is the resistance to CSS outflow. Um, and we always look at this when having a look whether the patients suffer from spontaneous intracranial hypotension or not. So resistance to CSF outflow is the most promising parameter from the lumbar infusion test. And uh, coming back to the um, diagnostic criteria from the International Classification of Headache Disorders, it says that uh, patients need to have a low opening pressure six centimeters of uh, um, water is the cutoff value. And looking at our cohort, these were the uh, first patients from this uh, previously mentioned publication. In patients that have a proven spinal CSF leak, you can see here the opening pressure being measured during lumbar infusion test. Uh, a little less than five millimeters of mercury is the cutoff value. And you can see that more than uh, almost 60% of patients have an opening pressure that's higher than the suggested cutoff value by the um, International Classification of Headache Disorders. So using the, the opening pressure by itself is probably not the right way or not the proper way to diagnose uh, spontaneous intracranial hypertension when having a look at the CSF parameters. Um, then uh, I'm done already with my part. I can hand over to Professor Ober, who will continue with the uh, imaging uh, diagnostic worker here in Freiburg. Yes, thank you, Christian Fung. Um, I hope you can hear me. I got a problem for one minute ago, so I lost the connection, but I hope you can hear me. So as you have learned, uh, the most important examination at the beginning is the MRI of the head. And it's not only the MI of the head, but also the MI of the spine, because it is a spinal disease. Um, there are a lot of findings in MI scans of the head. If a patient suffers from SIH, um, let's at the first call them head positive if they are positive signs. Um, if we have spinal positive findings, that means we have a spinal, longitudinal, extra tacal or extra dual collection of contours. So we have three different situations. We have a head positive scan and a spine positive scan. And depending on the location of these um, extra tacal contrast, we decide whether we go further with uh, dynamic subtraction myelography in a prone position or in a lateral decubitus position. And in some instances, we also need prone CT, dynamic CT myelography. Um, if there is no positive findings in, uh, no, no um, 
extratecal spinal fluid. We call it slack negative, but there are signs on SIH and on the brain scan. Um, we have another type that could be responsible that is the CSF venous fistula. Well, that is the introduction and now we go to the detail finish. So this is the patient, sagittal T2, T2 weighted scan before and after treatment with the epidural blood patch. And what you can see, you will see that is the small distance between the optic nerve and the pituitary gland and after treatment. Okay, that is, okay, you can't see my, okay. Yeah, so that is a large distance between the optic nerve and the pituitary gland. Um, you see also a large distance between the mammillary body and the upper surface on the pons. After treatment, compared to the situation before. Then you see a longitudinal spinal fluid between the clivus and the pons that has gone after treatment. These are all signs of SIH that can be reversed with, with treatment. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will see a schematic drawing where all the distances are, have been measured and we rely on these distances and say if the distance here eight, number eight, on the right uh, side of the slide is less than, it's more than, it's less than four millimeters, that is a sign of SIH. If the distance number 10 is less than 6.5 millimeters, another sign. So we call these signs and uh, make a sum of nine points. If patients have nine points, have a high suspicion of SIH and a CSF leak. If they are zero to two points, there's a low risk and they are also patients in the intermediate risk group. So next slide shows you the same findings on a coronal view. Here the superior sagittal sinus has on the normal condition a tree angular shape. And if you compare it to the patient with the SIH, you see it has a round shape with a um, volume plus. Again, you can look for number six. You see there is a small distance between the optic chiasm, chiasm and the pituitary gland uh, if the patient suffers from SIH and after treatment, this distance is large again. So on the next slide, you see two examples. On the left side, the patient before, and on the right side, after fixing of a ventral dual tear. So next slide. So again, we have three types, a ventral dual tear, a lateral leak with contrast or with CSF leaking in the axilla of the nerve root, and type three, a CSF venous fistula, where we don't have spinal extratecal fluid, but a direct connection from the CSF into the venous channel. Next slide. Again, left side, a patient with sagittal and coronal T1 weighted scans. Um, following contrast administration, showing a head positive scan suggestive of SIH. On the right side, you see a sagittal and axial reformation of a T2 weighted scan, where you can see, and Christian, please show this again, you see the extra tacal fluid that is between the, uh, the spine and the dura. So we call that again spinal longitudinal extradural collection um, and slack. So this is a slack positive patient with positive brain findings. So we next step is to find out where is the CSF leak, where is the supposed ventral leak. The next image shows you how we proceed. If you have a patient and you inject 
contours in the intertakal space and you wait for five minutes, you get this CT mitogram and you don't know where is actually the leak. So we have to put the patient in the prone position because the contrast is heavier than the CSF and put him in a slight head down position, inject contrast. And then you see exactly the point where the CSF goes in the epitool space. You see it's double contour here. That is one second later and you already are not uh, safe about the right uh, position of the leak. And that is, let's say 15, 20 seconds later where you have a long uh, collection, extra tickle collection, you're not um, where, where is exactly the leak. So it's really important to have the exact location of the ventral dual tear. Next slide shows that this can be difficult to assess in the upper thoracic spine because of the shoulder artifacts. So here we did not know, is it really T1, 2, or could it be 4, 5? And the next slide shows you how we go proceed with that. We do the same examination with injection of contrast during the CT scan. And the patient is in prone position and in head down position. And then you can see the double contour um, where the contrast exits the ventral subarachnoid space and goes into the epidural space. And then you see the axial images. This is a bony spur. And the, on the lower images, you see the extra tickle contrast. Right side shows you how the patient is positioned, but the next image image or next slide shows how it looks like. Patient is in a head down position and we inject contrast while we are in the scanner room, while there is a needle in the subarachnoid space and with injection, we acquire one or two or sometimes three spiral scans to exactly find the leak. Next slide now is a summary. If in the upper thoracic spine, we often have to use dynamic CT myelogram. In the lower thoracic spine and the upper lumbar spine, we uh, find the leak with dynamic myelography. And another information on the slide is that the majority of ventral leaks are at the upper thoracic spine. So we have to often to use dynamic CT myelography to find these leaks. Next slide, just a few examples. Here you would assume it should be the um, uh, lumbar, uh, the, 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 the disc prolapse, but the dynamic CT myelogram shows you it's one level below. Um, next slide, another one where you can see on the dynamic CT myelogram on the right side, exactly the transition from the ventral subarachnoid space into the epidural space. And on the bottom, you see the responsible ventral dural tear. Next slide. Another example uh, to show that it sometimes can be difficult to, uh, to identify which is the, the bony spur that cause the ventral dural tear. And here we have a ventral leak at the upper of these both levels. So next slide. So if we have large diverticular and no really slack, um, and we suppose that it could be a diverticulum that is responsible for the SIH symptoms, we place the patient in the lateral decubitus position and we perform either or sometimes both a dynamic myelogram and a CT myelogram to find out really a leaking cyst or in this case, a CSF venous fistula. That is the leakage from the CSF directly into the paraspinal and epidural veins. And to be a successful, the hips should be higher than the shoulders. 
And again, it's a, it's a, we have to find a position where the contrast really flows with high contrast in the region where we suppose to have the leak. Next slide. This is an example, a type two meningeal diverticulum, right lateral decubitus position. The contrast fills only the right side of the dual sac. And here's you see the um, diverticular. And if you look on the CT scan, um, there is uh, epidural contrast surrounding the tacal sac. Next slide. This is a type three CSF venous fistula, no, ex, no longitudinal spinal extratacal fluid, but a direct transition into the uh, paraspinal vein, which enters the azygos vein um, going ventrally. Well, next slide. I could make a little break, but I could also proceed with the treatment. Okay. Can I, of course, th thank you very much. Can I ask a couple of questions, if yes. that's possible? Um, excellent, by the way. I mean, that was really well detailed. Going back to Christian, the, the concept of the chronic subdural hematoma and ages under 60 when that happens, could you expand a little bit more on that? Because it's truly rare to find chronic subdurals, particularly you know, under 50, but we do see it. Under 60, we see a lot more, and typically they're over 70. But what's the proposal here? Are you suggesting that we should actively look for a cerebrospinal fluid leak in the spine when we see a patient under the age of 60 with a chronic subdural? And what recommendation would you make with investigation? So this is an interesting question. So, I mean, we just made the cutoff at the age of 60 because you said at some point, a chronic subdural hematoma has become very rare. And I think below 60 is very rare. Uh, I think that you should do a spinal workup for patients being of younger age and having chronic subdural hematoma because we see very often these patients don't improve after burrow trephination, for instance. So I think treating chronic subdural hematomas in patients that have an underlying spinal CSF leak is not the treatment of choice. Sometimes you can treat these patients by uh, sealing the leak and then the chronic subdural hematoma subside. Vice versa, if you treat the chronic subdural hematoma by trephination and don't treat the spinal CSF leak, this uh, can get a very serious uh, situation and these patients might deteriorate to very um, well low clinical state. Um, no, I appreciate that and I think that's very reasonable. Um, the, the issue is that we, we see so much of it and we often don't investigate. Maybe, uh, Jürgen, did you want to add something to that? And, uh, thank you, Christian. That's really, really good. Yeah. Very important. I, thank you, Mansur. I would like to underscore that bilateral chronic structural hematomas, early recurrence, and the lack of trauma are clearly risk factors for having a spinal CSF leak. So if you are really under age of 60, have it bilaterally, or do have a neural recurrence, please continue with spinal MRR or with a more elaborate search for the CSF leak. So there are additional risk factors for having a CSF leak. Thank you for that. It's very, very helpful. Um, a question also uh, for Horst, if, if you don't mind. Uh, that was very impressive radiology. Your scans are extremely good and high resolution. The distances to measure are rather tricky because they're so fine. So the sensitivity and the cutoff point would be quite difficult. You know, four millimeters, I think, was one of the distances highlighted between the optic chiasm and the pituitary. Uh, and then when you look at the mammillary bodies, do you think there would be difficulty with, with putting those as criteria because of the how we have to draw where the line is in the sand, how, how the boundaries are, are so yeah. tight? Uh, any comments about that? Yeah, fortunately, there's not only one sign, but uh, some signs that can be put together. Um, I have also my difficulties with the measurements, but we are currently working on an AI algorithm to find it really, um, um, to have a fully automatic evaluation of that. Thank you for that. That's great. 
Um, one other quick question, which I, I think people would be very interested in, is the concept of cerebrospinal fluid venous anastomosis and then leak, a channel. Do you think these channels are kind of just natural? They're there in everyone, but in some people, they're pathological um, because after all, that's how CSF is supposed to get absorbed in the head. Um, any, any comments about that? Because it's not something that we traditionally taught about. It's a bit like the presence or absence of um, a um, subdural layer. It doesn't actually really exist uh, until you develop it in, in, in vast majority of people. Any comments about that? Sorry, host. Yeah, we, we are discussing this issue uh, for, for a long time. It's the first uh, goal is to find is there an abnormal collection. And um, yes, we find these abnormal collections. And if we treat the patients, they get tremendously better. So there must be, there must be a pathological sign on one side. It can be that just by collecting or occluding a collector vein, it could help the patient. Um, it's, to be honest, at this time, we, I don't have a clear answer. Um, I know that we, it is a lot of work to find this fistula. Um, patients benefit from it if they occlude it, but when it's normal and when it gets pathological, I don't know. Horst, your, your candor is very refreshing and very respected because we also appreciate you get the extreme ends of the complex cases. Um, but what you said seems to be spot on. And I've got several other questions being put, but I wonder if Jürgen wanted to add a comment as well. I could see him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Manzo. This is, this is one of the key questions. I, I clearly believe, because there's sparse data, I clearly believe that spinal pathways for CSF clearance are clearly there also in humans. We don't know to, to, uh, to what extent, but once we see clearly channels, we see CSF venous fistulas on imaging, it's up to now clearly pathologic. No one has ever shown this in a, in a, in a healthy human being. So um, the, the next question is then whether these channels really form de novo or there are pre-existing channels that enlarge in pathological conditions or where the first there is a rupture, a tear or rend in the dura and then the veins rather collect the CSF. Nobody knows that, but as far as we know by now, once you see the imaging, it's pathologic. Thank you for that. I think that's very clear. Um, some questions from the audience. Um, Joran Kirstens, um, is asking, in which patients would you do invasive imaging to find the exact site of the leak in all of them? Um, and there's a comment from him that I prefer to try first an empirical epidural patch one or two times before performing invasive diagnostics. And I have to say that's a very common uh, a, a approach from, from most people. Um, but any comments from, from yourselves? From my perspective, I look on the MI scan. And if there are clear signs, um, we can try a, a blood patch, but if there is spinal signs, means slack positive patients, we know that only 10% of these patients benefit from an epidural blood patch. So we go for these patients for uh, invasive investigations. Thank you. Yeah, but um, to, be, to be clear, and this is what Christian try to show us that there is a stepwise approach to these patients. And before you jump on these patients with invasive imaging, um, you need to try a blood patch. A blood patch is such a simple, straightforward procedure. And only after one or two blood presses have failed, you continue on this stepwise ladder with a more invasive test. Horst, of course, is completely right. that we in the meantime know that in classical ventral leaks with a clear microspur, the chances of healing the patient with a blood patch is close to zero, but still the message here is if you have SIH, it's mostly a benign disease and do blood patches first. Only if blood patches fail, continue with invasive imaging. Thank you, that's excellent. Um, a question for, for Christian, because I think this is well up his street um, and I didn't think about this before. Dominic is asking, has anyone done MRI in standing or sitting position with SIH? 
Um, and I, I'm sure, let me just set the scene for the audience. When we had our third ever standing MRI installed in the UK, at that time, the same company had installed more than 200 in the United States. So, and you know, you can judge the reasons for that variation. But I wonder from your experience in Germany, if they're becoming more common and if anyone has done this. Uh, as far as I know, I don't know of any scientific publication that systematically evaluates uh, upright MRI in SAH. I don't know of any, um, please correct me. Um, sometimes we do have patients that ask for it. Sometimes we do have patients, rarely actually a handful of patients that did send MRI scans in the upright position, but they are of such a poor quality um, that we don't use them and we cannot um, use them because we don't have any, um, uh, how do you say, experience. And it's not, it is not an easy uh, talk, uh, easy tool, I would say. The venous channels change from getting up to lying down and you do not know what is normal and what is not normal. So the image quality is poor and the interpretation is difficult. No, thank you for that, Host and, and, um, and Christian. I think we're limited by the size of the magnet. I think they were limited to 0.5 Tesla. And, and I know there's a lot of interest in this with Chiaris, but uh, you set that uh, point right. Thank you very much. Um, we could go on with lots of questions. Um, um, I, maybe I could just ask one more and then we go with, with Jürgen's presentation, which I think everyone is itching about, uh, <laughs> including me. Um, but Anita's asking how reliable is ultrasound of the optic nerve sheath compared to MRI scans in terms of comparing the two? And I, yeah, please. In the beginning, we were very enthusiastic that we now have a screening tool. We don't. It's not good for screening. There's so much interrate variability and so much uh, um, disagreement between the raters and between each patient. But it's very, very helpful for follow-up because after treatment, either blood patching or surgical or endovascular treatment, you often have rebound hypertension, similar to intracranial hypotension. And you can discriminate these two conditions easily in the first group. Um, the optic nerve sheet goes up and enlarges in the second group, it's still small. So not good for screening, excellent for follow-up. Thank you, thank you, excellent. Okay, so um, I, I would sorry, look, go ahead. I would like to change the strategy and uh, share my screen so I can use the pointer that is uh, better. Okay, sure. Okay. You get it? So I continue with treatment. And yes, of course. Is. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it starts with the epidural blood patch. As Jürgen told you before, this is in many instances the first step. Um, so we do it fluoroscopy guided. And many of you will say, I don't need fluoroscopy for that. The reason to use to do is fluoroscopy guided is to be sure that we are exactly in the midline and to ascertain that we distribute the blood in the epidural space and that it flows upwards. Um, so to we exactly try to place a needle in the midline position. We use a loss of resistance syringe. And we want to get in this triangle. Or well, if you're not in the midline, you are more easy to miss this, the right place. Then we inject contrast to see if it's going upwards. And in the best condition, it goes up to the leak. This is a patient with a dynamic CT myelogram before and with a blood patch. Blood patch after, we inject as much blood as we can, 50 milliliters we usually want to have. In most cases, we have around 30 to 40 milliliters. This is another case where we, despite the fact that we have exactly hit the midline, 
And we have distributed the contrast also in the ventral epidural space. The contrast does not go upwards up to the Bernice, uh, to the ventral leak. Well, in this case, we have another strategy. We go CT guided. Some call it ventral blood page, but it's just from laterally into the epidural space. We inject some contrast. And then we see we are in the right position and inject blood. This is usually an approach done for the lateral cyst or diverticuli. Here you see we inject into the cyst, in this case, 50 milliliters of blood. And we try to yeah, get the blood clotted in this location and um, to avoid that the CSF can leak after the blood patch. Another example, just from the lateral position into the diverticular, fill it up with contrast and blood, and uh, hopefully the patient stays free of symptoms. And this is the next step, the CSF venous fistula. Uh, I told you before, it's not so easy to find them. Um, how would, would how should we treat them? Um, the usually step would be uh, just to ligate these um, nerve roots and uh, with the paraspinal vein, but there's now a new strategy to go via transvenous approach through the azygos vein. Here the accessory hemi vein into that radicular veins and to fill it up with onyx. Here you see that is a case from today where we have um, the epidural plexus before and after filling it out with onyx. Well, these are the treatment steps um, and now I pass over to Jürgen. So I will um, Jürgen will now share his screen, I think, yeah. Can we ask a very quick question while Jürgen yeah. is doing that, host? Um, so the very common scenario which all neurosurgery centers face is they get a patient with SIH symptoms and they do an MRI and it's contrast enhanced and they see dural enhancement and they see the slight sagging brain and it looks like it. And they do an MRI of the entire spine and they don't see an obvious leak. <laughs> and the common scenario is, well, I'll just try a blind blood patch. Yeah, that's, what, that's what a good, <laughs> good strategy, yeah. <laughs> so what, what would you advise in terms of this, the escalation of investigation as well as treatment? Because bed rest, maybe with coffee and tea, as people have written about, is, is one thing, but what would you say in terms of before going to do the blood patch? Is there anything you would specifically do before you just resort to a blind one? And if you do a blind one, what's the volume and level of injection? <laughs> okay. The first question is, is the spine MRI really negative? Is the quality high enough to exclude longitudinal spinal extratical fluid? Um, we have to do T2-weighted scans, we normally do a 3D space sequence and look on every diverticulum. Every axial view, is there a diverticulum? Is there slack fluid? Um, in most cases, the MRI scans are not of that quality we want to have. Okay. Um, if there is no fluid and they, if there are signs on the MRI scan of the head. Are there clear head signs? That would indicate this patient could have a CSF venous fistula and we have to go for invasive uh, diagnostics. If there are just um, some signs, like you see after a lumbar dural puncture, you could start with a blood patch. You could say I could do it just blind and give as much in as we have. 
we do it fluoroscopy guided to be sure that we really distribute the blood into the epidural space. We do it sometimes in more than one location just to get one position where the contrast really flows up. And if it perfectly flows, then we give as much as we have. Normally the patient after 20 to 30 milliliters, they complain of ischial gears. They say it's some, something in the back because the uh, contrast uh, clots and uh, the blood clots. So that is the disadvantage of a blood patch. Normally, if, if it would not clot, we could give as much as we want because it exits the epidural space um, at the C1, C2 level latest again. That is a false localizing sign. Thank you, Horst. So that's very useful. In terms of accessibility, what level would you pick? Let's say you cannot see a level and it's us mortals in most units. <laughs> would yeah. you say it's worth doing a blind patch and then which level? And Go one last level. question, if I may join on to that, how many levels do you think you can get at by injection at one level? Does it go up three levels, five levels from your experience? Thank you. That I wanted to show with the slides. One case, we have a perfect distribution. Next case, we only have two levels. And that makes a difference. And you cannot be sure what you get. So sometimes we inject in three or four levels just to find out a good position. But if you don't get it, we can't do anything. But you always do it with contrast so you can see where you're injecting and how much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. OK, I, Jürgen, I know you're itching to go. This is really good. Thank you so much. Uh, Please continue, my appreciation, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mansur, thank you, Horst. So just to add, endowed to a blood patch. And before we go on with surgery, we clearly do blood patches. And there's one, one thing we need to know before we go ahead with surgery. It's of course, as Horst has nicely shown, we need to know exactly, exactly where the leak is. Meaning this is just um, once again, showing these beautiful pictures of Horst that you, have the column of contrast flowing up the spinal column, and then you have a break, and you have a second contour, you have a super sign or whatever you want to call it. You have a second contour, and this is a very spot where you have the leak caused by a tiny microspur in this case. And only when you really confirm, when you're really sure where the leak is, you can go on with surgical therapy. I will show you the first video we did in Bern. We were very excited. Here is the head, here are the feet. We did a laminotomy, a fenestration. And this is a dorsal aspect of the dura. And if you look clearly on the high magnification, you have the pathophysiology. You have CSF oozing out here. We didn't find the leak, so we cut the dorsal dura, did a durotomy, grabbed the dentate ligament, little tiny little movement of the spinal cord and underneath we found this tiny little microspur who cut the dura, the ventral dura, like a knife. Now, here you can see this usually five, six, seven millimeter um, dural tear that you can close or you can suture with one or two sutures and the CSF oozing, it's gone. It's very, very rewarding once you found the leak. So of course, one of the first, or at least to my knowledge, the first description of this tiny little microspur was of course by Wouter Wouter Schiebing published this 1998. And they look exactly like in his publication, these tiny little microspurs, they cut the dura, the ventral dura, and CSF is oozing out. And as Horst has already pointed out, you can now easily imagine that these patients don't go well with blood patching because the knife is still in their back. So in these patients, when we have a ventral leak with a microspur causing the leak, Usually we need to go on with surgery. Knowing this, we still do one or two blood patches up front, not to miss the minimal invasive therapy before we go ahead with surgery. Some surgical impressions, these are the microspurs, and often they are already gone at surgery. It's, it ha really happens that these tiny microspurs dissolve and we have a couple or a dozen of patients where we clearly could show the microspur at some point in their disease at imaging 
and immediately before surgery, we repeated imaging and the microscope was gone. It looks like, like, like a part of a grain, like semiola, smaller than rice. It's really tiny and sharp and cutting the dura like a knife. And be aware of it. Here you can see it in pre-op CT scanning. This is the microspur, this is the microspur. Seeing a microspur is not equivalent with having found the leak. There are innocent microspurs and there are dissolved microspurs. So the microspur can already be gone or there are several microspurs. You need to know which one is causing the leak. So you still need the beautiful dynamic images for us to show. Of course, we found other pathologies. These are the so-called spinal meningeal cysts. They are clearly depicted on imaging and during surgery, you have here the fetal sac. This is the exiting nerve root. And this here was the contour of the, of the cyst. I grabbed it with a bipolar. This is the spinal cyst. And usually not the cyst itself is leaking, but this tiny little tear in the dura at this space. So as you see in the next image, here, this is a, a fresh, if you want to, um, an early operated spinal meningeal cyst. Here, is, here, is, here are the feet, here is the head. This is the exit in nerve root. This is a fecal sac. And here underneath, you, it shines through. There's a tiny little tear in the dura. This is the pathology. The cyst is merely the arachnoid outpouching out of the dura. And the longer it takes, the longer you need time for diagnosing the surgery, the thicker and the more scarring this tissue gets. So as depicted here in this, in this graphics, usually it's not the cyst itself, it's rather the tear in the dura, which is usually in lateral leaks always at the axilla where the nerve root exits the thecal sac. The arachnoid is pouching out, but the oozing is beneath the dura and the outpouched arachnoid. So as going ahead, we, we now introduced minimal invasive surgery for spinal cysts, we only used the small 16 to 20 millimeter uh, tubular retractors, and we you don't even need a hemilaminate to immediately chest of fenestration from pedicle to pedicle centered usually on the disc space. And you can go ahead, I will show you one, one short video. This is not a typical patient. She has had a BMI, a body mass index of 40, but still it's possible to continue. I hope the movie is running with minimal invasive surgery. So you only need a 2.5, one inch or three centimeter skin incision and your spinal surgeons are aware of that. You just introduce the tubular retractors and atypically in this case, an eight centimeter um, quite long tubular retractor was needed. And then you have access after fenestration, after removal of the flabum and opening of the dura and can clearly and easily see the ventral dural tear the disc spur is gone in this case. You can, as you can imagine, access the dorsal and the lateral part of the dura very easily. You have more problems entering the, the ventral dural side. So um, we can therefore cut the dura in SIH cases on purpose, cut the dura, do a dorsal durotomy. And since we are trained in tumor surgery and cavernoma surgery of spinal cord and so forth, um, knowing how to cut the dentate ligament, usually we use monitoring and now handle the spinal cord really carefully, but you are able to access the ventral side of the dura, meaning you are able to access the dural tear and if still in place, remove the microspur and seal the leak. This is how the procedure looks like. Cut the dentate ligament and then you have access to the ventral dural surface, to the microspur, to the usually five to six millimeter large opening of the ventral dura. I try to show you the, how this looks like under the microscope Why are these tubular retractors. And you have already the dura here doing a dorsolateral durotomy. You can here see the tubular retractor 18 millimeters. And then you identify here, identify and cut the dentate. And now you can freely move only a few millimeters the spinal cord and you have again access to the ventral dural leak and can close and seal it. And here you can see how essential it really is that you have a really good neuroradiology and that you really put all your efforts and all your the difficulty lies in the imaging that you find these tiny little spots. This is the real world. 
mitrospur, dorsal dura, ventral dura. This is the artist's rendering. Um, dorsal lateral durotomy, then you have the spinal cord, you have the dentate ligament, which is, was cut here as shown in the video, microspur and the ventral rent in the dura. So um, surgery meaning also reporting about complications. This is a published series um, from the time in Bern and we had excellent um, experience, but still operated on the wrong level in three cases and had luckily no permanent neurological deficit, meticulously monitoring, careful handling of the spinal cord. With increasing um, experience, and now only the, the minimal invasive cases here over the last uh, year or so, 72 uh, surgeries, we have now increase, increasingly diagnosed, and this number is to rise. We are, have two diagnosed today, as Horst has shown. I think this number is clearly rising. Um, we have summarized our um, complications with minimal invasive surgery, but still our experience also increased. So we still, with having the best neurologists for this, we still operate on the wrong level now in, in 3% of cases, but it still happens even, even uh, to us when we are quite sure and we go ahead for surgery and um, the complication rate dropped to 18%. Luckily, no severe permanent neurological deficit so far in um, up to now almost 185 surgical cases. So the question then is when to operate and Mansur, you touched this topic already um, how, how, when do you proceed with the blood patch? Do you do a second blood patch? Do you do days or weeks of, of bed rest and caffeine? And as we, we get gather more experience, we now know that it's time matters. It matters when you go ahead with surgery or with endovascular therapy. There seems to be a kind of a, some threshold after 10 or 12 weeks, after three months, and it's getting, um, more difficult to treat and more difficult to really get the patients back to their normal life. And this is also accompanied, as Levin Henny has shown nicely, not only by coping of the patient with the disease, but there are clearly mechanisms going on, changing mechanisms, the RCSF, the complete CSF dynamics is changing over time. So we can't tell what's really going on, but what we can tell is don't be too late uh, going ahead with surgery or endovascular therapy. And um, vice versa, we also know that complete resolution is most likely if you do it early, like I said, best in the first 10 or 12 weeks. And if it takes months or years, um, if you diagnose or find the league, or if you do a prolonged period of bed rest, patients um, um, have more, more difficulties to get back to their normal lives and to get symptom free. So this was a short, short um, expose about um, surgical therapy. And Mansu, if you want to ask some questions now, why should I continue with the key messages? Oh, you're very kind. I think that's uh, excellent and clear. Um, we've got some questions, um, which, and I've also got some questions myself, but if I could go to the audience, first of all, um, regarding um, Joran's question previously, he said, thank you very much for your response. As a follow-up question, as a considerable portion of SIH patients have underlying connective tissue disorders with fragile dura, um, which we know who they are, um, how often do you use an invasive diagnostic procedure? So uh, if there's any thoughts or experience regarding connective tissue disorders and the fragile duras that, that we know about. Usually, and at least in our experience, and we've treated now several hundred of, of patients with SIH and uh, 190 surgery cases, there is no weak dura. There is no weak dura, and also in patients with suspected connective tissue disorder, they are all tall and have Marfan-like symptoms. When you go ahead with surgery, you usually don't have any problems with suturing or sealing the dura. So then let's say in 99% of the cases, you have a straightforward cut, rent in the dura, or you have a CSF fistula. The very fancy cases with an extremely enlarged dural space, with an extremely um, um, enlarged lumbar dural space, usually this is not a prototypical SIH patient. And we've, we have these patients from other institutions referred to us with a so-called weak dura, 
once we do revision surgery, usually, I have to say at this point, uh, usually you find a normal firm dura that you can handle surgically, that you can suture, that you can see. Thank you. Um, I've got lots of questions myself, but I'm going to go along with the audience and I'll come back to my list. Um, so um, a, a very pertinent question, which I'm sure you've been asked many times, does ventral spinal cord herniation cause SIH, SIH, SIH as well? And if you could perhaps put me out of my misery as well and talk a bit more about the differences with the two. The reason I think this is a key question is for those of us who've dealt with these, which are quite rare, the ventral cord herniations, the morbidity is significant and no one has got a huge experience with it. But when the cord is herniating through, it's, it's a different beast. If you could expand on that, whether SIH and ventral cord herniation have overlap and are in common. Thanks. Thank you very much. This is an excellent question. And I think it's a spectrum of the same disease. You can also envision a spinal cord herniation at the aborted form of SIH. So I have no proof for this. We have operated now on, I think, 13 cases in Bern and in Freiburg for spinal cord herniation. And they all had these ventral dural rents and chairs completely looking similar to the chairs and rents we encounter with SIH. But the theory is that there's first the ventral dural tear, as so you, maybe you can see it here, and then the spinal cord kind of closes this leak and starts to herniate through the leak. And if you really look closely at your cases of spinal cord herniation, they almost all have slacks. They almost all have some collections around the spinal cord herniation. So our theory is that spinal cord herniation is a kind of self-healing process that the spinal cord closes the leak and this is to be honest, a spectrum of the same disorder. So would you say that there is, was a bony spur involved or how did that dura become? Is it that there's no bony spur, it, there was a rupture or a tear in the dura and then the cord herniation has essentially done what nature does? Yeah, I think as I mentioned before, usually there should be a bony spur, but the bony spur is so tiny and so little it may dissolve or you don't find it or it ends up in the suction device because it's really very, very tiny. And there's one publication, I think 2000, 2012, where new radiologists have extensively screened the literature and they almost always found spinal, spinal cord herniation at the disc space. So the, the mechanism is very likely, we don't have proof for that, but it's very intuitive and very likely that there's a Microspur, ventral dural tear, microspur dissolves, spinal cord touches to the leak, and we have a new disease, which is a spectrum of a, of a spinal, spinal dural tear. Thank you. Two quick questions, and then if that's okay, maybe we can go to the key messages, and then we have questions all the way. Um, what's your cutoff before you go for surgery, Anita is asking, um, in terms of... <coughs> You know, when do you say, okay, no more blood patch, or we're not going to even do a blood patch? When do you say, I'm going to do open surgery? Presumably after definitely having a location of where your target is. But could you expand and maybe a bit more about that? That's, of course, another key question. And the more patients we treat, the more confident we are that we should go ahead with surgery or endovascular therapy pretty early. I showed you some, some preliminary data that the later you treat the patients, the, the worse the outcome is. And as also Horst has mentioned, when we have a clear ventral leak with a microspur, the chances of healing these patients with blood patches is quite low. So, but to give you an answer, we go ahead with one, two, three blood patches. And after the third one, um, once we have um, found the exact location, we go ahead with surgery and please, in between several weeks. Don't cross this magic line of 10 or 12 weeks. Um, you should go ahead early with surgery or endovascular therapy. Thank you. Another question is, do you use neuromonitoring during your surgery? We use neuromonitoring in all cases in the beginning, to be honest. Nowadays, I don't use it anymore. It's we're just confident going ahead without neuromonitoring. So surgery with the tubular system, 
now is 60 to 90 minutes without any, any monitoring and and uh, at the moment we are confident with that thank you um I'm just going to ask one more question, then go for the key ones, if you don't mind. This is from Aproje, Aproje Gulash. Uh, if, a, if a patient has sagging of the brain, but no other features on MRI, how to diagnose spontaneous intracranial hypertension? Uh, we know Aproje well from Preston, I think. <laughs> Welcome. It's enough. Brain sagging and orthostatic headache, it's enough for the diagnosis. Thank you. Can I ask, a, 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 I think, a key question for me, which is, for me, you, you've shown very... To be frank, it's very intricate and quite complex surgery because it's not for everybody to open up the dura, cut a dentate ligament, retract the cord, find a breach and a tear, and put a stitch into it, and especially down MIS tubes and techniques. Do you think this kind of surgery is, and this whole diagnostic setup, which you've got so beautifully, uh, you've developed so beautifully well. Do you think this kind of work should be regionalized eventually in any in any land? Because you need a sort of high volume of work to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, to be honest, I think it should be should be better than in centers, and even more difficult than the surgery is. To be honest, the neuroradiological workup. It's so hard to find the leak, and we have so many false localizing signs, so many pitfalls. You don't need a good surgeon, you don't need a good neurologist, you need an excellent team that is dedicated to SIH and really has a lot of experience. And this is also our experience in daily practice. We have a lot of patients coming from abroad, um, from all over the world, and, and Many of them had surgery before at the wrong level or the wrong side or several levels open surgery. So it's not a surgeon, it's not a neurologist, it's the dedicated team. At least this is our experience in Freiburg. Well, thank you for that. Um, Jürgen, maybe we go for the rest of the presentation and then some more questions if that's all right. And a big thank you to you and Christian Host so far. Um, I have to say, Christian and Hurst, maybe they're going to get inundated with lots of emails and images to look at um, after this from all over Europe, but um, around the world. But thank you. Please continue. So you, you, you're looking at this prototypical image of, of SIH. Please don't forget this, memorize this, the subdual collections, the, the enhancement of the meninges, the brain sagging, big pituitary, no distance here, no distance here. This is SIH. And to be honest, in a patient with a GCS of 15, completely symptom-free while lying down and a headache while standing up, there is no differential diagnosis, okay? That's the diagnosis. There is no um, parimeningitis, there is no cancer, there is no empyema in a patient with GCS of 15, symptom-free while lying down with this image. Keep this in mind, this is one key message. Thomas and Eike from Bern really did an excellent job quantifying these signs. And we have four, five, six point five, four, five, six point five millimeters. As Horst already mentioned, and you mentioned, but so um, measuring is difficult. You can also download the app and summarize all these signs. And as Horst mentioned, we're working, and this, this looks very, um, very interesting. We're working on an AI algorithm that automatically gives you. The, the score and the likelihood of having SIH. Don't forget the spinal signs. Look for SLEX, spinal longitudinal extracecal collections. You, it's more difficult to interpret the spinal images, but you can't tell where the leak is. You only can tell the patient has SIH, the patient is SLEC positive. Then we try to put it into a, a scheme and keep it simple, there are so many schemes. I think Walter Schieving has done the first classification. If you keep it simple, there's type one ventral being there microspur or not, type two lateral being there cyst or not, and type three, a CSF venous direct connection. And I think this will change over time. And what exact position prone or lateral decupitus or prone and so on, this has to be really in the hands of the experts, also adjusting to the local experience. And people in, at Cedars or people in Duke are doing it differently than people here in Freiburg or in Bern. But you need your specific examinations to find the specific leaks. And you have um, a first 
guidance with head positive and spine positive, meaning slack or signs of SIH. Then you can go ahead once you found the leak rather early with surgery. You can use tubular systems when, when you're used to it and you can access all kinds of leaks, also the fistulas via a small 2.5 or 3 centimeter dorsal skin incision. Of course, and as Horst told us, this is just um, by Niklas Lutzen, an image he did today, um, excellent cast, I think, of uh, CSF venous fistula. Um, he has done today, this is the, the final result. And you see that the onyx clearly has occluded the draining system and the veins. The patient is fine. We will see how his SIH symptoms will turn out to be in the next days. Um, one, one point I really want to make is, is SIH dangerous? You know, some say, okay, keep, keep, in, um, keep the patients in bed, caffeine and bed rest for several weeks. I think it's a dangerous disease. There are um, more and more reports that patients with SIH, even without subdurals, present with coma. You also have these cases. And um, to give you one, a 52-year-old teacher, what, what's the disease? A 52-year-old female, completely fine, lying, headache and tinnitus while sitting or standing, bilateral collections, no distance between the chiasm and the pituitary, flattened pons, almost no distance between the mammary bodies and the pons, almost a Chiari-like appearance, completely symptom-free while sitting. This is SIH. There is no real differential diagnosis if we don't have contrast. And we did a prolonged period of caffeine and bed rest, and she deteriorated suddenly over, not suddenly, over several days and ended up with a helicopter in our emergency department with blown bilateral dilated pupils and so much brain sagging that there was even a brainstem hemorrhage. And we still managed to find the leak, but too late. We closed this leak, but too late. The, the outcome was, was not good. So to summarize again, the first and most important thing is consider SIH in your differential. Think about SIH. It's not, it is a rare disease, of course, but it's not so rare that you don't encounter it in your daily life as a neurosurgeon. Most often it's just a plain, simple five or six or seven millimeter long longitudinal slit in the dura. And remember, as Horst has shown nicely, the disproportion in ventral leaks is often the cause, but it's not the proof. You have to prove which one of the disproportions uh, causes the leak, or in case of a dissolved um, um, microspur, where the actual leak is. So we need dynamic imaging. And the same goes for the cysts or the reticular, I call it cysts, the spinal meningeal cysts are not the proof and are not equivalent with the leak. You need to find the leaking cyst. CSF venous fistulas are really increasingly, increasingly diagnosed. The, the, the groups in North America and Canada, I think they've shown us how to do it. Now we managed to find these leaks too, and we really diagnose them more and more often. And uh, I'm pretty curious how this will evolve. And also very basic CS of, CSF opening pressure is not diagnostic. Um, to be honest, I think in, in Christian, correct me, only in 40% of our whole series, the CSF was below the threshold as mentioned in the International Hatter Classification System. And another message important is that avoid chronification of the disease. It's not a denied disease. It's not denied benign because you can end up in coma or you can die of SIH. It's also not benign because a lot of our patients, they lose their normal lives. They lose their families, they lose their jobs. Don't prolong diagnosing, don't prolong treatment. It's not a benign disease. And to give you a number, I think 10 or 12 weeks is a kind of a threshold. Uh, until 10 or 12 weeks of symptom duration, treatment is easy and straightforward. Afterwards, it can get quite complicated. Continue to work up until you are really sure and you really know on the, on the 360 degree aspect of the dura and on the exact level, where is the leak? And then you can go on with microsurgical exploration. And if blood patching fails, microsurgery and or endovascular occlusion, I might say, is really the treatment of choice for these patients. So I think this is the summary, and I was so excited to, to be here today, Mansoor. I think it's, it's, we have to thank you that the EANS and, and you yourself and with Dr. Watkins and Palandri set up this task force. And I think 
there is so much going on and the ENS and the Cerberus Bio Free Task Force is really the platform to join and to develop and to find new, new solutions for this really, I think, difficult disease. And to give you an, an, an overview of what, what might come, there was an excellent question by you and one of our um, audience that actually spinal cord radiation is also a sequelae of spinal dural leaks. There may be many sequelae of spinal dural leaks. We just discussed spontaneous intracranial hypotension, but there are also, as Christian mentioned, subdural hematomas. I strongly believe that superficiderosis is also sequelae, a long-term consequence of a dural tear in the dura, of a tear in the dura. And there are more rare instances, but clearly spinal cord herniation belongs also in the spectrum of the disease. So this is from my side. Thank you very much. And of yeah. course, sorry, sorry, Mansour, I of course have to thank, as I mentioned it, this is a team approach. My excellent team in Freiburg, there are so many people involved, so many assistant and attendings, and it's, it's a lot of work. And these, these patients are sometimes really like chronic pain patients, very hard to handle. You have a long history, you have tons of diagnosis and tons of imaging studies. So it's really, really a lot of work and it's not really a reimbursed well. We do a, need to make a lot of studies. So you really need a dedicated team. We're expanding it to nuclear medicine and involving other people right now. But really thank you to my team in Freiburg. Uh, that was excellent, Jürgen. And um, you know, it flows brilliantly from uh, all the work that you've done with Christian and Horst and, and the whole unit in Freiburg. And uh, there's so many incentives to visit Freiburg besides the wonderful cathedral and the water is flowing through the books and all the, and all the nice soup that's legendary there. So uh, a few more questions for you, uh, if you don't mind. I think this is a great opportunity. Um, I, before I go on to the uh, panelists' qu questions, uh, sorry, the, the audience questions, some things which is sort of burning really, which has come up before. One is, what happened to these patients before, before this diagnosis? Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, people have been worried about, for example, the concept of pregnancy and Chiari. But we know, if you look back through time, no catastrophes have happened with pregnancies and Chiari and all the billions of deliveries that have happened in human history. And in the past 200 years, nothing has been clearly described as some sort of consequence. So we know that's not a concern. Regarding this diagnosis, what happens to all the countless number of patients who don't go to an expert center such as yourself? Are they self-remitting or are they just hanging around with symptoms for a long time? I personally remember a few in my lifetime, but I wonder what comments you have and regarding what happens to these patients with those hidden bony spurs or these scenarios who, I mean, do they all fix their pupils eventually, God forbid, or, or do they just settle down and heal, do you think? Both, Mansur, both. I think um, primarily SIH is a self-limiting disease in most instances. I think 80% of the cases are, are short-term self-limited and the, 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 the dual seals itself, like, like after dual puncture. But these 20 or 25%, maybe this, there's a selection bias, maybe even less, maybe only 10% with persisting symptoms, they end up or they may end up with not so much orthostatic headache, but still tinnitus, tinnitus, or, or dizziness and being like underwater, and they still suffer and they still lose their jobs and their families, and they have more or less true or false psychiatric diagnosis, burnout, and so on. So I think there is there is um, a number of patients that we as new researchers and neurologists may may help. Well, thank you for that. That's very important, very key. Um, You've, Horst and, and Christian, you've discussed the image findings. I wonder if you've done dynamic cardiac gated imaging. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, you see some beautiful images now um, where, where the pulsations of CSF and you can see the CSF flow and you can see the lamina terminalis moving and the floor of the third ventricle go up and down. Have you done any of that in this condition? And could that, do you think, add to your diagnostic yield in terms of the pulsatility that you might see around the third ventricle and also looking at the spine itself where the site of leak is? We could work with phase contrast MRI to see spinal cord motion, fluid motion, not with cardiac gated. Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, uh, 
that could work. A lot of things to be done in the future. Yeah. If you do remember me or remember us, <laughs> the whole group. Um, we'll do. Uh, great. Can I just come back to the, one of the questions from the audience, um, if I may? Um, Instead of blood patch, Dimitri is asking, would you advise of experience with PRP injections? Um, I think he thinks of PRF. Probably, that? yeah. Probably. Yeah, we, we are considering this. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. Um, re regarding um, the expertise which you have, can I ask, are there any other centers such as yourself that you know of in Germany or even in Europe and I'm again pushing on this point seeing what you think because I have met patients who suffer tremendously with this and they write and they plead can something be done and etc surely there's an argument for having very a low volume complex work with with a, a very expensive painful lengthy diagnostic yield that should be in specialized centers. What are your thoughts about that? And be as frank as you like. You, you want to say, um, or maybe I can comment on this. I think like uh, Jürgen said before, it's um, about the dedication and about it's about the team. And you have to find the proper neurosurgeons uh, in, in combination with the new radiologist. And then they have to be very dedicated. These patients are so time consuming. The workup is so time consuming and costly. Um, to be honest, I don't think that there's another center in Germany that puts so much effort in these patients. I don't say that other centers cannot treat these patients, but uh, putting so much effort into the workup uh, of these patients and the treatments, um, I don't think that I know any other center in Germany. So, so does that mean that, for example, all the excellent centers, which there are many, uh, in fact, I'm sure all are super, could try the basics with the conservative treatment and a blood patch. And if, if things are persisting and not healing, is that the time to consider sending them to a more experienced unit or a setup like yours? Yes, I would say so. Okay, no, that, that's great. Uh, any other comments regarding that, Jürgen uh, or, or Horst? Um, you asked this question before and I, I, I re restate my statement that you ne really need a dedicated team. And um, we have so many excellent centers. If you decide to go on and to, to, to do treatment of SIH, I think you can easily achieve it and do it. But it's a lot of work and it's so time consuming and um, the examinations are costly. And Horst and Christian, I myself, we look at these images every evening for sometimes an hour to, to find the league and to decide what's going on. We founded an SIH board where we meet Every, every week and discussing all the cases, sending out the recommendations. So um, we are happy to, to take uh, images from other centers, but we would be happy to share our knowledge that um, several other centers may evolve because there are, I, think, I really think that there are many patients out there that uh, need treatment. But once you decide to go for it, it's, um, it's a long way, and, but it's clearly possible. And there should be many centers, of course. Thank you for that team. One of the suggestions we could make is what we're going to do as the task force hopefully becomes a section, each subspecialty of the CSF disorders, for example, Chiari, for example, complex hydrocephalus, for example, NPH um, and neuroendoscopic procedures will have their own dedicated web pages. Um, if you have very key important diagnostic guidance material to use, particularly protocols, such as the ones you've shared already with the key messages, we'd be delighted to put that there on the website uh, later this year or as soon as possible. And I think this would be very helpful for, for everybody uh, to kind of use uh, as, a, as a good guidance. Uh, and a big thank you to everyone for that. Um, I, I have to say, this has been brilliant. Um, the, the key messages have been fantastic. I've, I've learned so much myself and I'm so grateful to you. Um, to the whole team really at Freiburg. And if you wanted to come back and talk more about this or even anterior cord herniation or something else related, then we'd be delighted. Um, but a, a big thank you to you all. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. 
uh, and the comments from everybody is saying the same thing. So thank you. Thank you, Horst. Thank you, Christian. And thank you, Jürgen. Welcome. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again. And uh, marvelous stuff. Wonderful. Thanks to everybody. And I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.